there's a, a few twists and turns in this one. We're going to go back to 1993 and it's February. So it's quite cold, a bit nippy winter. That's right. <laughs> yes. Wednesday, February the 10th, 1993, in a beautiful village by the name of Wadhurst in the county of East Sussex, which is an area that I know very, very well. So this murder, I don't remember it personally. My husband thinks that he does have some recollections because he grew up in this area and knows it very well. A couple, newlyweds, Nicola and Harry Fuller, were sadly murdered in their Wadhurst cottage and were found dead by police and Nicola's parents a few days later. Mm -hmm. Nicola was 27 and she'd met Harry, who was 45, only six months before, several months before, let's say. Whirlwind. They had a whirlwind romance and then they got married. So they'd only been married about five months, I think, when this tragedy occurred. Harry was a car salesman and he was a bit of a wheeler dealer type, like loads of money kind of flashing the cash down the pub and all that kind of thing. And he used to always brag about having thousands in his pockets and briefcase full of cash or loads of money in the attic and all this kind of thing. So he's a bit mouthy about the money. Nicola, on the other hand, was quiet, reserved. I think she'd worked in a jeweller's in Tunbridge Wells and she was very much a family girl. So when her parents, Barbara and Michael Johnson, didn't hear from her after a couple of days, they began to worry and they'd been trying to call their house. So after a few days, they called her work and when they discovered that she hadn't been in, then they really got worried. So both of them got in their car and went round to the Wadhurst cottage yep. they lived not far away in a place called Pembury which is near Tunbridge Wells mm. they lived in a rented cottage on the high street of Wadhurst and it was a busy road which took traffic from East Sussex right through to Tunbridge Wells mm -hmm. and behind the property was a big car park which they had access to which is perfect for Harry and all these cars buying and selling and all that yeah. stuff so they turned up they went down to the car park they noticed that Nicola's car was still in the car park and then they went and had a peep through the kitchen windows. Well, there they could see Nicola's keys and her handbag were on the table by the back door. But they also saw Harry's feet sticking out of the utility room. Oh, my Panic God. set in. They call the cops. Cops arrive. They insist that they break the door down because the cops are doing the knock-knock thing. Yep. And they're like, no, no, just knock the bloody door down. We know something's wrong. So they burst in, found Harry in the utility room and... The police went upstairs, then called Michael Johnson upstairs where he discovered and identified his daughter's body, sadly. No father ever needs to do that, Jesus. They really don't. And it's a double murder. It's very sad. And Michelle, I will say right now, when I finally finished looking at the documentary, there's a documentary follow-up from Crime Watch narrated by Jill Dando that you can find on YouTube. Michelle will link you up. I was in tears. Oh, my God. Because his family... A very lovely family, and it really shouldn't shouldn't happen to anyone, really. But it's just so sad that what happened to this family. So the devastated Johnsons, so Barbara and Michael, the parents of Nicola, mm. they made a heartbreaking police appeal for witnesses on the TV, which was just awful to watch, because the police had nothing to go on except for one fortuitous piece of evidence. Okay, for some reason. Harry had changed the couple's telephone number several times in recent months. Okay. And in fact, the last time was a few days to a week before the murders. So anybody who rang the house would have to know the couple very well Yes. in order to have the number. But additionally, Harry, for some reason, was also tape recording all his phone conversations. Can I just stop you right there? This is shades of my story. I'm getting weird vibes right now. You got the oh vibes, Jordy. You got the I vibes. I got the vibes. <laughs> well, I hope it's not the same fucking story because I'll be pissed off. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've lost my iPad for now. Anyway, let me go back to what I was saying. What was I talking about? Harry was tape recording all his telephone conversations. Mm. So this is very handy for the police because they didn't have a thing to go on. So one call in particular was made the night before the murder a Steve had rung and had a brief conversation with Harry. They seemed to know each other. And Steve had arranged to visit the cottage the next morning at around 8 a.m. The two men made a plan. So police realised this timeline worked, but none of the family recognised Steve's voice. Mm. The police took the decision not to release the fact that they had these recordings so as not to give the suspect a heads up 
So nine weeks later, when they didn't get any further, they contacted Crime Watch and they got ready to air the dramatisation of the events where the actual phone call was actually played and an appeal for information went out. Wow. Many people who saw the programme recognised the distinctive voice of Pembury local Stephen Young, who was a 35-year-old married father of two. He was an insurance broker running his own business and totally against the profile that the police had put together. He had no prior convictions and no known links to the underworld. Okay, but how funny that everyone could identify this guy's voice. Oh, yep, yep. yeah. I came round to that. <laughs> it was very distinctive. It wasn't the Kermit the Frog voice that I just did, but it was a very distinctive <laughs> voice. You can hear it on the link that Michelle's going to put at the end of the episode and on that episode of Crime Watch UK. So, friends of Stevens, when they saw the episode, I mean, a lot of people rang in, an anonymous person rang in and said exactly who it was. Mm and then hung up and other friends got in touch with Stephen to tell him about his voice being on the program but he denied all knowledge <gasps> of it he said he didn't know what was going on so then the police came a calling and he was ready for them so he was cool calm and collected and at first he told them yes he had arranged to go and see Harry and when asked why did he not get in touch with police after he was murdered the same day why didn't you tell us anything well he, th- he thought there was nothing to report nothing unusual had happened but during questioning it was revealed that Stephen Young was a member and treasurer of a legitimate gun club and had several firearms at his home. Oop. So this is the beginning of his story changing many, many times. So they arrested him. They had time, place. They had the weapons. Yep. These guys were really doing their jobs. Often we slam the police when we tell these true crime stories. But actually, having watched Crime Watch UK, I really feel like the police in this case did a thorough job. Amazing. So they also had CCTV from the bank manager across the road. There was a Lloyds Bank And he came across, when he saw the investigation going on, he he said, I think you might find this useful. He gave them the CCTV. Remember, it's the 90s. Mm. It's all black and white and all dodgy. But he had a distinctive modified white golf. And that was seen on the CCTV matching the timeline. Dude did not try and cover his tracks, not even one little bit. Well, what he did do was drive his car straight away that day up to Norwich So when they asked where his car was, he said it was getting work done in Norwich. Why Norwich? It's so far away. It's the opposite end of the country to Sussex. And actually, because he's such a flash git, this guy, he's got a mobile phone in his car. Not like a mobile phone because they're very, very new at this point. He had one of those car phones. And there was a call log which showed that he had called the Fuller's house at 10 past 8. The neighbour of the Fuller's had heard gunshots at around 9. And it was also found that Young who was in great financial difficulty, had paid in £6,000 almost entirely in £20 notes the day after the murders. Oh, my God, he robbed them. Because you had said this geezer was like, yeah, yeah, got cash in the attic, cash everywhere. Blimey. He told police that money was savings that he had been keeping in £20 notes. But the forensic sweep of his paperwork, it noted that there was pressure on Stephen Young to come up with a lot of money quickly or his business was going to go down the pan. And he'd been asking friends for loans and making notes of who he'd asked and their answers. (gasps) So there was no way that he was saving six grand when he was desperate for a a big amount of cash. And he was keeping a shit list. And not only that, but all of his accounts showed that he was just financially desperate. So that money would have been spent if he'd been saving it. Then there was a big kicker. They found a loaded handgun under his children's bed. Creep. Come on. When questioned, he said, well, you know, that's where, you know, I keep guns. (gasps) In the house. But why loaded? Oh, I don't know. Why under your child's bed? Oh. Well, they're not going to find it. Yeah, they no, bloody I, are. No. <laughs> what if they do? The police felt that Stephen Young was so calm and cool as he explained himself during interrogation that they named him the Ice Man. 